So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Will Yoon. Uh, you, all, you all know him. He's one of our uh, vascular surgeons. Uh, yeah, as a background, he um, did his fellowship at Loyola where he worked under Carlos Becerra and got developed an interest and, uh, and an expertise in complex endovascular uh, uh, aneurysm treatments. He uh, uh, expanded that with some time both in, in Uppsala as well as um, Germany, right? Germany, and in fact, he's in his uh, enrolled as a PhD student uh, in the University of Uppsala uh, program. So he's going to speak with us on bridging stent grafts and fenestrated and branched aortic uh, and uh, endografting. So please uh, welcome Dr. Yoon. Thank you so much for um, the kind introduction, Dr. Mel. As I was thinking about topic for today's grand round, um, I had given a um, presentation uh, in regards to VVARS and BVARS uh, last year. So I thought this could be a follow-up to that, just as sort of a part two, because we tend to focus a lot on the primary graph, but um, sometimes we forget about other accessories that goes along with it, which is, is equally important because a lot of um, the complications happen from those. Okay, so this is my disclosure. So a couple of slides, or first few slides are from last year's presentation, just to uh, go over that part again, especially for the incoming uh, or new residents um, who have not seen the presentation last year. So as we know, first the aortic surgery has to make sense, and, and that, um, in early days um, there was really no data in regards to whether the aortic surgery actually saves lives. So this is one of the early um, landmark paper um, by Dr. Uh, Zilagi in, in Michigan. And, and he has shown that um, the aortic surgery indeed had a survival benefit to population, which justified the surgery. And this is uh, classifications for um, thoracic abdominal aneurysms. And one through four is classically Crawford classification and type five is um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Safi has added that type 5 into that. So that's the sort of extent of um, thoracic abdominal aneurysm when we uh, discuss and in, in, in any um, cardiovascular surgeon's mind, when we say type 2, type 3 thoracic abdominal aneurysm, this is sort of um, the figure that we imagine in our um, head. And these surgeries, classical type 1 through 4s, are repaired in such fashion, and just uh, extent of the aneurysm is involved, and that's the part of the aorta that's replaced. So these are some of these um, superstar surgeons from Texas, where they've done truly a lot of surgeries um, over time. And of course, with that, uh, they had dedicated anesthesia team as well as uh, ICU team, as, and when uh, they work as truly as a team, the outcomes um, are actually quite remarkable. And it's really hard to match these results. As you can see here, this is California data. For elective surgery, 30 day mortality of um, uh, patients in the 70s was 19%, and when it reaches 80-year-olds, um, the mortality goes up to 20 to 30%, which is quite high. And, and California is not alone in this um, relatively poor result. As you can see, this is Seattle data, and, and for open aneurysm, you're looking at, for elective cases, nearly 17% mortality, while endovascular surgery had 4% mortality rate. Um, this is uh, more recent um, publications from this year. Um, as you can see, type 4 thoracoid, uh, uh, thoracoid abdominal aneurysm is concerned. They also had quite high mortality compared to endovascular arm. And we do know that open surgery has long-term durability, and if one can tolerate such surgery, this is a surgery that we would normally recommend. And in, in case when patients are not um, deemed fit for open surgery, we offer endovascular surgeries, or sometimes we offer endovascular surgery as first line of therapy now. And to, it, when we try to do surgery, the, the basic tenets of surgery must hold, and in my mind, that if we're offering endovascular surgery, it's best to mimic open surgery, thus uh, performing fever where the anatomy is preserved. So that's a catch-up from last year, sort of um, one of those Netflix, you know, what has happened in previous episode, and now we're getting into a new episode. And 
on the left side of the slide is open surgery. Um, as you can see, it's, it has quite nice exposure requiring many hands sometimes because as we all know, exposure is everything and sometimes these retractors don't do a uh, good enough job which requires a lot of people's hands. Whereas um, the, for the endovascular arm, you may not need as many arms, but you do need tons of different supplies to make this happen. As you can see in, in, in picture in top right, there are many different wires, many different uh, bridging stands, many different catheters that may be involved. So um, going back to history, it's quite interesting because the first um, VVAR uh, was performed by none other than Korean colleagues, and I'm quite proud of that, although they're interventional radiologists, so uh, you can't have everything. Um, but this is first reported VVAR uh, that was published back in 1996, and this was performed to uh, preserve my renal artery. So for the audience who has not seen the surgery before, I put a quick um, summary video. So in real life, it takes a little longer than the video itself, but uh, video highlights the key um, steps of each surgery. So this is a patient with the, who had um, pararenal um, um, abdominal aortic aneurysm. By definition, that means that aneurysm that ex it involves the renal arteries. So the the fenestry graft, the primary component of the graft that has been delivered and partially deployed, which is still um, constrained. And each individual artery is then cannulated. Uh, in, this, in this case, we perform everything through the femoral access. And once the, um, the, the visceral arteries are then cannulated, the bridging stents are then delivered through the sheath. And we are molding this to help the, balloon, um, the primary graft to fully um, expand and have a proximal seal. And once that is done, the, each individual bridging stents are then deployed and, and, and then the, they are flared um, so that there will be a good seal between the two components, uh, the primary graft and the bridging stents. So we do um, one at a time because of difficulty doing uh, simultaneously. And once that is done, distal body is then uh, delivered. Um, the ipsilateral limb is then deployed, and then contralateral limb is deployed. And in this particular case, I had a little concern that while we're delivering the distal body, it may have potentially crushed one of the mesenteric stents, so this was re-ballooned um, as a precautionary measure. And this is final angiogram without any evidence of endoleak. So that's how we do the endovascular surgeries for, um, the treatment for that is, this particular surgery is actually similar to um, uh, type 4 thoracoabdominal aneurysm. So a lot of times we consider these as a thoracoabdominal aneurysm, although technically these are pararenal, anu uh, pararenal aneurysms. So as you can see, these are sort of consortiums around the country and, and United States where they have uh, some form of CMD access, which is a custom-made device or company manufactured device, which is not readily available in the market yet uh, since they're investigating the device. Um, throughout the country. And as you can see, very few centers have these and very few patients have access to these type of surgeries. So the question is, um, sometimes we use a lot of terminologies and unfortunately, um, um, this can lead to some confusion. So what is fenestration, what is fenestrated branch, and what is just branch? So what that means is, where the graft, there is a fenestration where the hole is, for the visceral vessels, and when the fenestration perfectly lines up and is in opposition to the target vessel, and then if we were to stent it, that's fenestration. Fenestrated branch is a case where the fenestration is actually quite far away from the target vessels, and we are linking those two with the bridging stents. That's that's uh, that's then uh, considered as fenestrated branch. And uh, directional branch is where there's a cuff of um, um, uh, sort of um, uh, arm, if you will, going, uh, directed toward the target vessel, but again, quite far away, and we uh, link those two with the um, bridging stents, as you can see here. So those are the definitions. So then you, one might ask, when do you use fenestrations? When do you use branch? The advantage of fenestration is, especially when you're working a small lumen, 
where there is not enough lumen for the direction of branch to navigate to the target vessels. So cases such as this, quite narrow aorta and the fenestration right next to the, the target vessel. So in this case, fenestration is much uh, easier to uh, deal with. Whereas direction of branch where there, there is this cuff here and then your, uh, the, uh, the, per, um, the goal of this is to link this cuff to the target vessel which requires long bridging stents. And to do that, you need enough um, lumens within the aortic uh, lumen to navigate to the target vessel. So there are many, there are, broadly speaking, there are two different types of cover stents that we use as a bridging stent. And bear in mind, none of these were actually designed to function as bridging stents. And we, we have come to use these peripheral stents uh, for these surgeries, and they have actually done quite well. Although one of the br uh, bridging stents, um, uh, VBX, is currently undergoing trials for 10B trials, and they're using VBX as purpose of bridging stents, so probably it will be the first stents which is la on label used for uh, bridging uh, stent purpose. So there are balloon expandable stents and self expandable cover stent. What that really means is that balloon expandable stents require balloon inflations for the stents to deploy, whereas a self expandable stent uh, does not require balloon for it to expand. Um, so when we think about bridging stents, there are four important um, uh, points uh, or um, uh, factors that contribute to its long-term uh, um, patency. And, and of course, one is looking at patency itself. It's quite important. It's interesting to note, though, um, although when we talk about endovascular surgery, we look at patency of all you know, primary graft uh, patency, the limb patency, and bridging stem patency. But it's interesting because when we look at old literature, when we used to do a lot of, or they still do, but um, for the open surgeries, the patency of individual um, graft leading, going to target organ were never truly studied. And main outcome was survivability and uh, morbidity from the surgeries were what was more important, but today, we um, look at much more than what was looked at for open surgery in the past. So um, as we do more and more of these surgeries, one of the important, out, um, one, one of the more important outcome was bridging stent patency and longevity of that stent. And as you can see, this is um, a Strush's, um, uh publication from um, quite a while back now uh, from Cleveland where they have looked at 650 650 patients and looked at reinterventions for each bridging stance. And as you can see, the reintervention rates were, in fact, quite low. And uh, branch related mortality was less than 1%, which is truly remarkable. And all death came from um, mesenteric ischemia. And this is more of a heavy hitters from the European uh, group. They're all, uh, they're surgeons from different centers, and they've looked at their outcomes for their fenestrated and branches. And as you can see here, um, overall the outcomes were good, um, but in, in this uh, study they have shown that fenestration fared better than branches in terms of patency. Uh, now we have to bear in mind because each centers have different um, protocols as to when they use fenestration branches and which anatomy, and some centers were limited to branches, some centers had more um, uh, freedom to mix and match uh, fenestrations and branches. So you have to take for what it is, but we, what we do know is that um, these uh, bridging stents do quite well over time. And another question was that self-expandable versus a balloon expandable stents, and there was really no difference between the two. Um, however, the visceral branch patency uh, was better than um, renal branches. Now, um, as I, um, this is um, sort of a picture that was borrowed from uh, Dr. Orderich's slide, and each center and each surgeons have different preferences um, as to how you would build the primary graft. Um, so whether fenestrations or branches, or exclusively fenestration, exclusively branches, or fenestrations and branches together in the same graft. Um, so these are sort of a nice bridges that, that we think about. When you think about bridge, you think of a functional bridge, beautiful bridge, and those are built well that last throughout time. 
Whereas there are some bridges that is not so good, where it leads to truly nowhere, poor planning, or um, they've completed a bridge, but there's no road beyond that. And sometimes they have to bring those bridges down and to build a new building next to it. So um, sometimes it's not really the bridge's fault. The bridge may have been good, it just it's in a wrong place or perhaps at the wrong time. It's same with the bridging stents. Um, sometimes it's not the bridging stents fault. Um, the target vessel may not be healthy enough or they may be just really tortuous or the end organ that target vessel is applying may not be viable. So you may have high resistance of flow hence the bridging stents um, uh, patency may be poor in that particular case. So we have to think about, um, we have to consider what we are um, trying to achieve. Um, that then we can plan uh, surgery correctly and have better outcome. And this is one example of directional branch. As you can see, um, it's heading um, south, as you can see here, and then makes a sharp turn. It doesn't take a lot to imagine that flow dynamics for this stent wouldn't be very good, and in cases like that, you may have a um, branch occlusion. Um, this is another case. Um, this is a patient who had a type 1A endolic from previously failed EVAR, and we did the four cuff repair. And as you can see, once we do deploy stiff uh, bridging stents here, the distal part of the RDMA um, have a kink um, afterward because of the rigidity of the stent. And it's important that we treat that right away because if you were to wait, uh, these bridging stents may fail. So, um, again, um, there are many types of bridging stents that are available. At one center that I have visited in the past in Germany, um, uh, Professor Verhoeven uh, tends to use uh, um, a Vanna V12, uh, for the, especially for the renal stents. And as you can see, the patency of that is extremely good, 96.4% um, of five years. And so now we have established the patency for these bridging stones are reasonably good, despite they were really not designed for that purpose. Um, the next question is, if stent is good enough, how do we get it there? Um, it's one thing to have something, but if we can deliver the goods to um, our target destination, then, then it's, really, um, uh, it's a really a problem. It's like that movie, I think it's called Martian where we have tons of food, but we just can't get it to Mars. That's a problem because you can show them the picture of good food and Earth, but if you're at Mars and you can have them, that's a problem. And it's nice to have a stent, but we have to be able to deliver target vessel, which is real challenge in these cases. So there are two forces that we have to remember. One is insertion force and one is retention force. These balloon expandable stents are mounted on a balloon. And as we discussed before, they are deployed by inflating the balloon, which means that once the balloon is fully inflated, the stent has to detach from the balloon. But while we're delivering this um, stent, that stent should not detach from the balloon. So it's, uh, it's, you have to have a right balance between um, how it stays on the balloon at the same time when we want it off from the balloon, it has to come off. So, um, these are some of the feared uh, complications that can't, well, not technically complication because you could solve it before that were to happen, but type of event that you don't want to have in the surgery. As you're delivering the stent, a uh, stent comes off prematurely and hasn't been deployed. This can lead to a big problem and it, it may take a lot of time to fix this problem. So, so that's when insertion force overcomes retention force and then the stent can be as floating in the target vessel. So um, this is one example where we have cannulated right renal artery and we have confirmed this is renal artery here. And as you can see, because the orifice is so tight, we are having trouble delivering the stent through. So we have balloon in order to open up the artery more, but still had trouble um, delivering that. But fortunately, because retention force of this particular stents were good enough, we were able to deliver it without having sheet um, a position in the artery. And now we are finally um, flaring the stent here. So that's some of the characteristics we would like to have because it's not 
Many times, the delivering sheath into the target vessel can be of a challenge. This is another example for iliac branch case. Um, as you can see, we have a through and through wire and a, a telescope sheath here for uh, as support, uh, you know, in order to achieve uh, maximal support. And this stent is being delivered into the hypogastric artery or internal iliac artery without having sheath park inside. And, and uh, because of retention force is quite good for the stent, and we were able to push the stent without uh, further support. And it's flexible enough to make this um, uh, quite heavy bend here. So next uh, part is once we deliver, the stent has to behave predictably because these were really just designed to be balloon, not to be flared. So when we fit, flare these balloons, as a fabrics flare, they foreshorten. And we have to have a certain degree of um, predictability as, as to how much it will foreshorten. Otherwise, then we have to use additional stents, which uh, leads to um, uh, uh, higher cost for each procedure because these stents are not cheap. As you can see here, we're um, um, ballooning the stents and we're flaring it here and has flared nicely. And, and the, the fabric has not fallen outside of the stent grass, but yet it can seal with the fenestrations here. So having this predictability is quite important. So last part is integrity of the stent. Um, because we are literally abusing these stents by flaring, because again, they are never really designed to be flared, one has to wonder when we do flare, does it lead to stem fracture, uh, fabric tear, and and uh, things like that? And and uh, that part is quite important because we've been using it such way, but no one really knew as to how they behave. So um, Professor Alsermann um, from Germany have studied these um, uh, in his um, uh, as a bench test, and have used most commonly used balloon expandable stents here. And he has a balloon, and he has placed in a machine where there is constant motion to mimic arterial blood flow, and have shown that there's really no stent um, um, fabric damage when we do flare, which is good to know because these are the stents that we have been using without truly understanding how they would behave in the early days. And and so far, um, the results for these stents seem to be pretty good. So at UC Davis, um, most of, if not all, well, all cases were fenestrated or fenestrated branch cases, except for internal iliac branch case. So what that means is that, that we have um, homogeneous data where all these visceral fenestrations are fenestrated cases. Um, we have some cases where we have um, intentionally unsupported fenestration especially for celiac artery. So this is a pararenal aneurysm patients. Uh, we can have enough seal here. So we have left the celiac artery unsupported fenestration. What that means is that we have fenestrations on the graph, but we don't have bridge, bridging stent going into the celiac artery. Um, this is, of course, a preoperative CT scan, CT scan, and this is post-op 3D image. And the reason being is that, as you can see, the patient has degree of arcuate ligament um, anatomy. So if we were to put in the stent here and expand, um, I was always taught that nature always wins. So this can lead to stent fracture over time, which can lead to a problem. So understanding one's anatomy and, and adjusting surgeries accordingly, I think is uh, quite important to have a better outcomes of the surgery. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, so this is some of the pictures. And to conclude, um, VBX will, of course, I think will be approved as a bridging stent role, but uh, up until now, there was really no approved stents, but we have been using it uh, for that purpose with pretty good outcome. And as uh, when we consider bridging stents, uh, patencies is, of course, important, but uh, at the same time, um, deliverability of the stent as well as um, other handling factors that may play a role is quite important as well. So this is... Um, the photo, there, um, I've included some nice pictures. Uh, I think most of my uh, uh, partners as well as friends do know that on my phone I really don't have any other photos than the case photos. So I found few 
nice photos. Um, this is one uh, picture where we're doing angioscope. Um, I think I'm the only one doing this now because Dr. Pavek retired and the machine is not being used, so I figured I'd make a use out of it. And this is one case. And I think we had the graft um, uh, infection with MNM today. And this is another case where a patient had a graft infection. We were able to salvage this, and and we uh, this is um, sort of arts and crafts class in the operating room. We're making um, antibiotic bees, and fortunately, um, patient actually have healed, and we're able to preserve the graft. And um, Joel likes to make fun of me for this, and which I have stopped using now. This this uh, laser glasses um, makes it really hard to see. <laughs> but I these are some of the fun photos I found on my phone, so I figured I should put it at the end of the slide. Thank you very much. Well, well, that was really a great presentation yeah. and um, a reminder that innovation is such an important part of what we do and how we advance fields, and that it involves some risk taking, and it involves you know, going through a learning curve, but when you think of the evolution of almost every field that we're in, whether it's transplant, pediatrics, trauma, and certainly here, um, you really bring tremendously important skills, and we really have appreciated uh, this. I think we have a few minutes for some questions. There are comments from the audience. Dr. Rodriguez. That was a great talk, Will. I, you know, I. I it, 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 it never ceases to amaze me your uh, technical abilities uh, when it comes to doing these cases. Uh, you mentioned the BVX, a uh, balloon expandable stent. Uh, in what vascular beds do you use that as opposed to other, like the renal vascular bed? Do you use a BVX there as well or use a different kind of stent? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. A lot of, um, so I think it's really a surgeon preference. Um, the way I think of, um, so VBX is slightly more expensive than ICAS that we have used previously and still use. And uh, VBX requires seven French sheets, whereas um, VBX, uh, sorry, ICAS for renal purpose, I could uh, get by with six French sheets. And and it's it's um, and not that one stent is better than the other, they have unique characteristics for both. VBX has really, really good retention force, so we rarely see that stem come off from the balloon, whereas ICAS have made improvement uh, compared to their previous generations, but it can still happen where the stem can come off of the balloon. So um, another difference is that VBX is a bit more flexible than ICAS, and sometimes the flexibility is what you will like it, to have for that vessels, but at the same time, sometimes you want the rigidity. So for example, the renal vessels are re reasonably straight, not all, all the time, but uh, sometimes I would like to anchor that graft by the renal, so I like to have rigidity for that purpose. So a lot of times I use ICAS for the renal vessels. Whereas the mesenteric vessels are concerned for um, SMAs and celiac, sometimes they're quite torturous or they're down, ang uh, down going angled. So for those, I like to use VBX because sometimes it's quite difficult to place a sheath into each vessel. So you could, because retention force of the VBX is quite good, you can actually go without the sheath support. So um, you have to, it's, it's like using, I don't play golf, but having many, I guess golf club has many different, I don't know, irons or what have you. Um, and so you use, you know, right stick for a different occasion. <laughs> I guess it's a different gear. Sometimes you need second gear, sometimes you need third gear going into the curve. Um, very incredible the technology. I did my last vascular case in 1986, so it's been a while. Um, my, my question is, if you have complications, aortoenteric fistula, or you have like a leak and, or a gunshot wound, or, are you committed to fixing these um, endovascular, can you tie off, can you clamp off uh, one of these stents, or can you get control of them? What, how do you deal with the, the complications? It seems like it would be really hard to deal or open up a 
vessel that has the stent and thing in it. Yes, um, thank you for the question. That is, aortic enteric fistula, whether you had a simple or complex repair, it's always tough surgery. Um, um, because usually they present in an urgent setting and when you're doing these big open surgeries and uh, someone who is critically ill is always tough. Um, so there are some data as to what to do with infected endograft. And um, um, of course, uh, the book answer is explant endograft, reconstruct the artery, and then have a sterile or at least clean field as much as possible or anatomic or extra anatomic bypass. Um, but for the patients who are truly, really sick, then there is options to actually preserve the endograph um, as, and, and um, try to prolong functional life as much as possible. So sort of kind of a middle ground approach. As far as uh, the branches are concerned for trauma purpose, we can individually um, ligate or coil embolize those vessels. And we do see sometimes, um, fortunately we haven't seen here, but when we are doing these um, fevars, those wires can perforate end organs, for example, um, the kidneys. And, and uh, intraoperatively you may not see, but on the, you know, at, at the recovery you may start noticing um, hypotension and such, and those have been uh, coil embolized um, in other institutions. So there are different approaches to handle each unique scenarios. Dr. Humphreys asks, how long do you think these patients need to remain on dual antiplatelet therapy after these procedures? Thank you for that question. There is really no standard. Um, everyone has different approach. Um, the way I do this is um, I have all the patients uh, placed on dual antiplatelets, and then usually I see them in a the month, six months, and a year uh, for first year, and if it's quite good, then we follow yearly basis. So uh, my practice is that when patient has six month follow up and all the bridging sins are looking pretty good without any issues, then I transition to a single antiplatelet therapy, so usually aspirin. Thank you, I, I enjoyed your talk. I, I wanna lean on your um, experience and interest in what's going on in Europe because in many ways Europe is so far ahead of us because of access to, to uh, endographs and devices and so forth. You know, it sort of re reflects on your first slide where the, there's just a few places where some of the really state-of-the-art stuff is being done in the U.S. Where do you see our path um, in terms of access to graphs, um, you know, access to the new technology, you think that we will um, have what Europe has anytime soon, and what do we do in the meantime? Um, that's a really good question and a very um, difficult question to answer. Uh, it's like trying to understand stock market. Um, um, so in Europe, um, up until now, their regulatory body was pretty... Um, um, I suppose less strict compared to FDAs here in, for the medical devices are concerned. Um, so they were able to have early access for these devices for the past 10 years. And with recent regulatory changes, they may be becoming much more difficult in Europe as well. And there is some talk as to whether FDA would ease up some of these regulations because it's, it's sort of difficult to imagine that most companies who have manufactured devices are American companies yet in the United States, we don't have access to these devices. And, and sometimes we are forced to offer open surgeries where we are um, a bit hesitant to um, offer that surgery because of their um, age or comorbidity. So um, I think, um, and Europe is, um, with the UK's um, NICE guideline before it was f formalized, They've looked at some cost effectiveness and, and, and such. It's, it's huge controversy as to what is right, and sometimes it's really hard to put a dollar figure in one's life. Um, but the way I see this is um, as fields grow and more knowledge is obtained, it's, it's very, very difficult to be master at everything. The way I see this is sort of like orthopedic surgery in a way. They, 
and thus specializing different parts such as elbow or hand or spine and such. And I see that happening more and more. Um, I think there's true need for good open surgeons because they're hard to come by nowadays um, because a lot of procedures are in an endovascular fashion. And, and when the endovascular is, con as far as endovascular is concerned, um, we do a lot, but not every endovascular therapies are the same either. So the way I see this is, in, in Europe, you see this more than not, more than here in the United States. Um, there's open vascular surgeons and those who specialize mostly in endovascular surgeries. And, and uh, VascuNet, which is sort of European um, um, database, so it's sort of like BQI in the United States, they have shown uh, that as they regionalize centers, they have, the outcome has been better. And UK has been one of the outlying countries in EU before the Brexit and all that. Um, and they have decided that uh, they will regionalize their care in UK. And within three or four years, they have shown their result uh, matching rest of the EU um, countries, which is probably pretty good population study in my mind because once they made those changes, their outcome just improved. And it's not that they've come up with new surgery. So it, it's, it, that's, um, that's, I think, pretty strong evidence that regionalization of certain difficult surgeries do make sense. And that's why we have bariatric centers of excellence and, and, and such. So um, I think um, as the fields grow, I think people will specialize more toward a certain aspect. Um, I think that's how I see it. Um, some may have different opinions about it, but um, that's the trend that we've been seeing in different parts of the world, and I think United States may follow. Last question from Dr. Really enjoyed your talk, Will. Thank you. It's obvious that this uh, technology has really advanced in recent years, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm sure that the indication for uh, open renal renal artery bypass surgery has changed. I'm wondering, is there still any indication for an open renal artery bypass? And then related to that, for the m most complicated uh, cases where you have uh, stenosis in the you know, secondary branches, we used to do the um, auto transplants, ex vivo reconstruction and auto transplants. So is there any role for that? Because it seems like you're able to get to these uh, peripheral branches a lot better with your your new stents. Yeah, I, I thank you for that question. Um, there are a couple factors that we look at when when we think about renal vascular or uh, renal artery stenosis or disease. Um, um, speak, uh, you know, I'm sort of a more recent uh, graduate from the training uh, program, and I can say that I've done zero aorta renal bypass for renal artery issues. Most of these bypasses were, you know, when we do open thoracic abdominal aneurysms and such. And mainly because a lot of disease that, at least that we've been seeing is proximal renal artery stenosis at the ostiums or the proximal area. So they, I think they do reasonably well with um, and stentings. Um, but of course, if the diseases were more um, widespread, uh, then I think open surgery would be indicated. Then again, there's other uh, factors that plays in as to whether the intervention is even necessary because we don't always treat um, all renal artery stenosis. So a lot of times medical therapy is, is sufficient. So I think interventions numbers are already low and but most of the interventions that we do for renal artery stenosis are endovascular. But that's not to say that, that open surgery doesn't have a role and usually there are uh, anatomic reasons as to why they would need open surgery versus endovascular therapy. Thank you. So thanks again, uh, um, Dr. Yoon. And I just come to the microphone so that everybody can hear that it's with mixed emotions that I announced that uh, Dr. Yoon has accepted the position to be the director of the aortic program at the North Shore Hospital in Chicago associated with the uh, University of Chicago. And while on one hand, we really congratulate you about this great opportunity, we're also selfishly sorry to 
lose you from the UC Davis family. We've had lots of conversations about um, Dr. Yoon's best career opportunities. And I promise you that, number one, we really um, feel privileged to have been part of helping to launch your career and that I intend to take credit for all the great things you do. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, thank you, Will, for this great presentation. Thank you.